work out okay. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I will. I'll know by um, day five. Okay. All right. Um. Oh, good. All right. We're good. This is good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, batter up. Anybody have a question? Uh, number 26. I don't really understand how we're supposed to add. Is this 26 uh, on the multiple choice? Take a look. Uh, the one that you wait in a laboratory, a student wants to quanti uh, quantitatively collect the CO two gas. That question. Yeah. Okay. Let's share that document. All right. So um, you're looking at it, and uh, generate by adding. So you added sodium bicarbonate solid to two point. 2.5 molar hydrochloric acid. The student sets up the apparatus to collect the CO2 gas over water. The volume of gas, the volume of collected gas, is much less than the expected volume because CO2 gas. Um, so here's the question. Um, and maybe this could take, this is probably a little bit of having to um, more common knowledge. Um, so you've got the very soluble water is produced at low pressure, is more dense than water vapor, has a larger molar mass than that of N2 gas, the major component of air, has a slower average molecular speed than water vapor at the same temperature. Um, so I don't know what the answer is right offhand, but whenever I see carbon dioxide and they talk about water, um, I think about seltzer water. And when I think of that, it it reminds me that carbon dioxide is actually soluble in water. Um, you know, it's a good example of, of when you talk about solubility of gases in liquids, the things that you need to do that you wouldn't think of, you know, if you want to make a solid soluble in water, you need to agitate it, stir it up. You need to heat it up. You need to break it up. All these things you have to do. For gases, it's like the opposite. You know, you need to, to cool it down. You need to put it under pressure because um, you think of um, uh, you think of, of uh, when you open a soda, it's under pressure um, because as soon as you release it, gas molecules start to come out of the solution. So my guess is that the answer is A. Does anyone have the answer? It is. It is. So, and then, and that one is more of a common knowledge. If you want to look at it like this though, CO2, while it is a a nonpolar molecule, the oxygens um, have, they have a, the, the polarity of the bond between the carbon and the oxygen, oxygen being much more electronegative element, is going to be, um, it, because of, because the bond polarity is going to set to the oxygen, the oxygen is still going to have some attraction for those hydrogens. Whereas if you do something like uh, butane or methane, something of those hydrocarbons, because carbon and hydrogen are so close in their electronegativity, um, for AP purposes, you might as well just consider carbon and hydrogen to have the same electronegativity and that their bond would be an, um, a bond that is um, nonpolar. So that's the only piece of that that I, you know, I, I can see that maybe you wouldn't have thought about beforehand. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, is there another question? Um, I was wondering about some of the grading for um, the free response question. Sure. Um, there's ones where it's like what volume of this molar solution would you need to make? you know, a certain volume of a certain molarity. Right. That was really bad. But, um, <laughs> and I just use M1V1 equals M2V2. Okay. They, they go through all the moles. Right. And work that way. Is our method still okay? Yes. 
so we'll still get full points for right. that. Right. So what happened with this practice test, as an example, um, they 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 don't use m one v one equals m two v two. That's a shortcut. It's like using um, now in for this test coming up. It's like using the Henderson Hasselbach equation or the Nernst equation to justify something. It's absolutely okay. acceptable, but they don't necessarily teach it. Um, okay. So I would say that that it is okay. It's about the moles. And the other thing about the practice test is they're not going to show you the different answers that are acceptable. If this were a real test, there would be like two or three, especially for the free response, there'd be two or three different quite or answers that would be acceptable because there's so many, once they start taking a look at the test, then they say, oh wait, you know what, the student's right, we should accept this one or we should accept this one. Because this was a practice test, whoever wrote it, they just, here's one answer, go with that. Could add Marina it's in the chat. Okay, I see that. So I'm gonna copy that. I really am disappointed that I blew that as far as getting people invited. Okay. Alright, so does that answer your question, Caitlin, about the scoring? Yeah. Okay. Um, I see that Sneha uh, asked for multiple choice 33. So you guys can still see the, the test, right? Mm -hmm. I've been scrolling rather quickly, but you guys can still see it. All right, so multiple choice. Oh. 33. Oh, these solubility ones. I maybe should have spent more time on that. Which of the following would produce the least mass of, oh, this isn't solubility, I'm sorry, I read wrong. Which of the following would produce the least mass of CO2 if completely burned in excess oxygen? Okay, so it works. you have to look at um, you have to look at like sort of a balanced equation to see um, to see how many moles of CO2, um, and you need to look at how many moles of your substance do you have as well. Um, so unfortunately this would be one of the questions where you could like this would be a second pass question you know on the first pass through the test you answer all the ones that you can look at and figure out let's say in the first 15 to 20 seconds then the second pass through you answer all the questions that you know you could answer but it would just take a little bit more time and this is one of those types of questions because what you need to do is you need to figure out how many moles kind of like just roughly looking at how many moles you would have of each and then in a balanced equation how many moles of CO2 you would end up producing and so um the your more weird. I can just see your icon oh really yeah oh. I can still see the test you can. I can too wait what <laughs> well okay, okay I don't know what's wrong with my computer never mind did you see it now yeah, I can see it. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Uh, let's let's do a screen share of the bamboo tablet. Can you guys see the bamboo tablet now? Or 28 plus 4 is about 32. Mm -hmm. So the more mass of carbon added, the more mass of the whole thing. So I just made ratios uh, of all of them, which everyone had the smallest ratio. I don't know what's happening here. Here we go. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the, the first, your temptation would be to say CH4 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. And um, in balancing that equation, just real quick, let's see. If I was going to put a 2 right there, that would give me 4. That would be good. But that wouldn't work. Oh, no, 2 and 2 is 4. So you put a 2 right here. That's pretty easy. And then 10 grams of CH4 would give us the most amount of, or it would give you the least amount of, least mass of, of CH4. And it's a 1 to 1. I, I, without even having gone through that, I would just say that the answer is A. What was the answer? B. B, yeah. you're kidding. At least massive CO2 in excess oxygen. Yes. What I did is I went through and figured out the ratio of the moles of each of the 
ratios of the molar mass of all the carbon in the uh, molecule over mm -hmm. the molar mass of the whole thing, and just whichever one had the smallest ratio. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, it ended up being kind of a shortcut. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the carbon would be, it's more of the CH4, that makes more sense. Whoops. So, oh, that totally makes sense. Wait, Katie, can you repeat that? I, um, I made ratios for each of the parts, and I took the molar mass of all the carbon in the um, molecule over the molar mass of the whole thing, and I just kind of rounded, um, um. and then... I simplified all of them, and then just wish everyone had the smallest fraction. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. I like that. So let's see. That's uh, 16 and 12 is 28 plus, so like 32, mm -hmm. 24. Oh, wow. That's, that's a 24 over 28, 24 over uh, 30. And 48 over um, plus 16, 54, 64, uh, was it 70? Yeah. So that's over half, that's over half, that's over half, and that's over half. This is not over half. And if you were just going to, you could probably, and they probably wouldn't care if you used fractions here, actually. Um. They probably wouldn't care at all if you use fractions. And then you could just say five halves here, right? Did I do well, that right? It's four, multiple four. choice, too. Um, this is true. Yeah. That makes more sense. Whatever fraction, I can't think of what that fraction is right now. Five, three. I don't know. Makes that six. Maybe this would be... I'm probably going too far by trying to balance this. Four times four. I think you're good. Oh, I'm off on my oxygens. Um, oh, would it be three halves? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. Three halves, three, four. There we go. Jeez. Okay. So that makes sense. Nice job, Caitlin. Thanks. All right. Did <laughs> Sneha, did Caitlin answer your question well? Yes, she did. Good. Okay. Um, Caitlin Clark. Oh, back to Caitlin. If our answer is 0 0.01 off because of rounding, is that acceptable or will we miss that question? Um... You're talking on the free response, right? Yeah. Um, there is some there is some rounding. It's not too bad. I will have to admit, I have not heard of what the rule is for that. Like I've heard the rule about sig figs, but I haven't heard the rule for the rounding. So your question here about being 0 0.01 off, it would depend on what the answer is. I mean, it's really almost a percentage. Um, you know, if your answer was supposed to be 5.41 and you got 5.42, um, I can't imagine them taking off, but I don't know. But if your answer is 0 0.00145 and you got it at 0 0.01145 or something, you know what I'm saying? Like, obviously right. that's a huge percent okay. error. Yeah, there was one where if you rounded, it was a solubility thing, and if you rounded to two Mm -hmm. And if you rounded to two sig figs then, and then multiplied it by the liters, then you got you rounded correctly to get their answer. Okay. But if you left it with more, like I just leave it in my calculator. Right. Time, right. And I multiplied it by the liters, and my answer rounded to point or it was instead of point zero zero one seven, I got point zero zero one six. Okay. So, which wait is this the free response from this test? Can we take a look yeah. at it? What number was it? Um, okay. 
Okay, let me share the, the test back for a second. Um, so, I see what you're saying. So, in if if yours what was it what was it so yours was 1.6 times 10 to the negative third and theirs is 1.7 times 10 to the negative third it, was there anything after the six uh yeah it was like i think it was six four one six okay. four four zero okay so it was really close it was really close because i left where they have 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative third mm -hmm. i had like 3.299 okay and so when you multiply that by 0.5 doesn't round to 1.7 right i would say this um they if if they rounded so at the the point right here which is 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative third the rounding right here is not following the rules of doing sig figs you shouldn't round until the end of the problem so you're correct in carrying it to that point um and that argument would be made at the reading so you should be comfortable doing that um okay. I would also say this, this ties into Sneha's question. Um, you should try to do the sig figs based on the question. And so looking at this question, BI, it's only two sig figs, the 0 0.50. Um, but I've always told you that when in doubt, put three. And um, it was even written, I don't know if it was like 12 years ago, it was written in one of the answer manuals that, that answers were accepted plus or minus one sig fig. So if it had two and you put three down, then it was okay. You would still get accepted. And even up until a couple of years ago, that was accepted. And there was one problem where um, there was an answer that required four sig figs and they actually marked down for it. And there was a huge uproar from the AP teacher community. Um, and so the teachers, but the basic consensus was that students should try to get the right number of sig figs each time, but that there's that that would only apply to one there would only be one question on the free response section where sig figs could be counted against a student so it's hard to know which question they're going to do that on okay. um so again you're back to when in doubt put three um but on this one you see there's two so you should go with two and if yours is 1.6 times 10 to the negative third and there's is 1.7 i think that um that's not a significant enough difference to mark you down and i think you would still get full credit Okay. So you said we put three, we should be okay? You should be okay with putting three. And and that's been what I'm trying to tell students all the time. Like just, you know, if you just put three throughout the entire test, you should be fine because, you know, you see two here. And like I said, there was that one question where you had up to four. And looking through it, I don't see a lot that go that route. A lot of these just only have two questions. Here's a three, one, there's a three, three. Um... I've only ever seen one go to four, but I've never seen an answer in the free response that was only one sig fig. So that's why I feel like three is the safe number. Okay, so the next question, Caitlin Solomon asks, can you explain the difference between the end point and the equivalence point? And I would be happy to. Um, let me do something really quick. Okay, so I'm going to switch this back to the uh, bamboo paper. Okay. So, um, we have a chart here. Okay. So, an end point of a titration. End point. If you're talking about, so this is titration. An end point is where, um, so one substance. Um, completely I'm sorry if this is not very easy to read completely reacts with other okay 
So um, an endpoint would be, uh, let's see, you have, I'm trying to think of a good one right now. Let's say if I had, um, H C two H three O two. So you've got acetic acid plus sodium hydroxide, and you get the C two H three O two minus plus. Um, well, because this sodium would go away, so it'd be like that, and you would end up with your H two O. Um, so that's kind of like a net ionic equation right there. You got to get rid of that sodium because it would be the same on both sides as a spectator ion. So what that would mean is this titration curve would be for a weak acid and a strong base. And then an equivalence point so an equivalence point is usually when you have equal amounts of reactant and product. And for our purposes, most of the time, the end point and the equivalence point are the same thing. Um, so that you, um, so that, so because as you can look by this reaction, if one has completely reacted with the other, then you're probably going to have the same amount of reactant as product, because since you started with like this HC2, H3O2, and the C2H3O2 minus, so the acetate ion with the acetic acid, when they're at, at equal amounts, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, we're talking not we're talking about more more, I'm sorry, I'm getting that wrong. You're talking about more of the the um, base and the acid together. So when you get to that endpoint, the equivalence point, they they've reacted with each other, and so you you end up with that equal amount of more of water. I guess I'm kind of I'm getting you confused a little bit here. I apologize, but the point is is that is that I I believe Caitlin this this question is coming from um, that there was a question on the test that was talking about how you could get a false endpoint, and you could think that you've consumed it all, but you're you're not there, and I don't I don't remember if that's exactly it. So when you're looking at when you're looking at, at these, like here's a graph of this, this weak acid, weak acid versus strong base. And that when you are, when you get to the end point or when you get to the, the equivalence point, you're going to have, if this is seven, right? You started off low, whatever this, I mean, this is zero. It would pretend like it was at zero. And you have this long buffer region because when you mix, when you mix, mix acetic acid with, sodium hydroxide, when you have more acetic acid than sodium hydroxide, the first part when you add it, you're going to create a buffer. That's how you create a buffer to begin with. Now, the buffer itself is a mixture of the weak acid and its conjugate uh, base, right? And we've covered that before. I think we've talked about it a few times. Um, so, so, uh, so you get this, this long buffer region, and then um, you get to the, the equivalence point. Now, when you get to that equivalence point, I also want to kind of parlay this into something else, um, that when you are at half the volume, right? So this is volume along the bottom, and we'll say that this is pH along the y-axis. When you get to the equivalence point, half the equivalence point right here, is where the pH is equal to the pKa. And this goes to that Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Um, because this is saying that, that at the equivalence point, all of the ac acetic acid has been consumed with all the sodium hydroxide at that point is, uh, that's been added from the burette into your Erlenmeyer flask. And um, if you remember, oh, I pressed the button again, didn't I? Take it right off.
Did it come back yet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, give me one second. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, sorry. So, looking at this, the, what I want to, I want to turn this into something else. So this, this, this point right here, pH is equal to pKa plus log of, um, base over acid. Wait, what point was this again? This was, at this point, it's the, it's the half the volume of the equivalence point. Okay? So, when you're at that point, when you're at half the volume, of half of it's been used up, that means half of this has been produced in this. And this is where I spoke wrong earlier, and I apologize. When you have the same amount of the acetate, the conjugate base as the acid, that's basically the log of one, which is zero, which makes the pH equal to the pKa. Okay? Now, once you have, so, but what, okay, so that's, I want to remind you guys of that because that's important. Um, so that's half the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, I'm going to draw that again. You have um, you have a lot. You've consumed all the HC2H3O2 plus. We'll just go to OH minus. Okay, so at the equivalence point, all of this is gone, and you're left with this in solution. And C2H3O2 minus plus H2O being a conjugate base, it's in equilibrium. It's kind of like that's in equilibrium. It's in equilibrium, so you're gonna go, it's gonna want to go back to the H uh, not two. H C2 H3O2 plus OH minus. Which means that your when you do this, you're gonna produce more base. Okay, even though all of the acid has been consumed, you're left with the conjugate base, which means it's going to produce a base even though it's just sitting in water. Which means that the actual equivalence point is above 7. Does this ring bells for you guys? So at the equivalence point, it's above 7. So don't, what I'm trying to, I'm trying to work my way around to is that don't think that the equivalence point is going to be 7. And that's why I picked this, this example. So do, does that make sense that, that equivalence points don't always equal seven? It's about when we say equal and it's all about the moles, moles of acid, we'll say being equal to the moles of the base. Is that good? And so for the most part, equivalence and endpoint are the same thing. Now, Here's where it gets thrown off. The endpoint, and I remember the question now, it was talking about the indicator. An endpoint is usually determined when the indicator changes color. Okay? So if you were doing this graph right here, and this was a question I think I talked about briefly in class, you want to pick an indicator that that changes color around what pH. If this is 14 up here and that's zero down there, that's seven, where do you want your indicator to change color? On the equivalence plate? Well, yeah, but what, so looking at this graph, I know it's a poorly drawn graph, but if you had to estimate what kind of pH would you want your indicator to change color at? Yes, kind of in the 8 to 9 range. That's where you want your indicator to change color. So what if, okay, we're talking about the indicator again. What if you picked an indicator that changes color at 2? 
is that going to truly show you it's and 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 based upon your observation if you picked an indicator that changes color to two you might be led to believe that the end point was at a ph of two and would you be correct no no so this goes back to you need to pick the correct indicator the correct ph range based upon what you're mixing together we have a weak acid versus a strong base well we know that the equivalence point is going to be above seven it's going to be basic so we want an indicator that changes there so the end point on the graph should be the same spot and i'll change color here just for fun your your indicator should change the same point as the equivalence point so you want to pick a ph an indicator that's going to change color at that point does that make sense miss solomon maybe yes maybe no you're still there yes okay all right so oh and looking at the looking at the chat so um let me just jump down amanda mclean uh the key is on schoology it is called the college board practice exam um if you continue to have struggles with that let me know and i can probably um i can email it to you if you don't find it on schoology all right so going back though uh caitlin clark do we have to put answers in scientific notation or can we leave it with decimals example okay if you're within like three, you're probably fine. Um, and that's probably fine. The, if you want to put it 0 0.0016, I'm okay with that. As soon as you start getting numbers that that get pretty high, like if you're looking at 10 to the negative 13th, 10 to the negative 12th, mm -hmm. even 10 to the negative 8th, I would expect you to put those in scientific notation. I have not heard of, of readers marking off for not putting it in scientific notation but i'll and as much as i want to believe that readers are all going to be very um objective and not be persuaded if you make it difficult for them to read it i don't think that they're going to be as helpful on the grading i just whatever you can do to put the readers in a good mood you know um because some you never know when yours is going to get read if it gets read in the first couple of days everybody's in a good mood and happy if they get read on the last day of grading then they might not be as enthusiastic so uh try to try to do it in scientific notation when you can um okay. yeah so don't sass the graders basically yeah don't sass the graders yeah <laughs> yeah if you finish your question with yeah you know what i mean yeah i don't know if they're gonna go with that Right. I can understand that. I think that, um, you know what you should do is maybe write down what your calculator gives you. If, okay. if your calculator gives it to you as 0 0.0016, great. If your calculator gives it to you, usually when it gets bigger like that, they the calculator will switch to scientific notation, what makes right. makes it quite and a bit that's easier. that's what I usually do. I just write down whatever I see on the calculator. Good. Good. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Mas preguntas. And how 42 on the multiple choice? 42 on the multiple choice. All right. I will switch over in just a second. Oh, here we go. All right. College practice exam. Highest boiling point. Ooh. Oh, intermolecular forces, IMFs. All about the bonding too. I mean, moles and 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 bonding are just so huge in chemistry in these tests. College board loves to talk about bonding. I mean, I can't even tell you enough. I can't encourage you enough to study your bonding and make sure you're familiar with it. So um, let's let's read it. Which of the following aqueous solutions has the highest highest boiling point at 1.0 atmospheres? So I'm going to switch to 
the bamboo paper because I want to draw some of this out and see if it helps. All right. I think we don't have to do this yet anymore because this is easy. 42 on the multiple choice. So we're looking at we're looking at calcium chloride. We're looking at sodium sulfate. We're looking at sodium chloride. We're looking at potassium bromide, and we're looking at C6H12O6. Okay. Um. Oh. Oh. All right, I'm gonna let you guys off the hook because this one is really all about colligative properties. Doggone it. So, um, you guys may vaguely remember that, um, that the more ions or the more particles that are in the solution, the lower the freezing point when making ice cream. Do you guys remember that? Very, 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 very vaguely. <laughs> it was one of those, hey, if you want to make ice cream in this class, you're going to have to do this, you know, scienceheat.net site, and you're going to have to, it's that and stuff. So basically the point was um, that the calcium chloride is going to break up into three parts with a 0.20 molar solution. The sodium sulfate is going to get three parts with 0.25 molar, so it's going to be a little bit larger. There's only two parts with the 0.30, and there's two parts with the 0.30, and then sugar, which is covalent, so it's not going to break up at all. So what you see is what you get with the 0.40. And so looking at that, um, I have not looked at my key. I'm going to guess the sodium sulfate. Yeah. Okay. Um, just because it breaks up into three parts with the highest molarity. If you multiply these two together, I'm sorry. I totally thought that was going to be a bonding, meaning like your, your attraction, like you have, it's a good time to talk about this dipole, dipole. And you have ion dipole. And um, then you just have ion. But, um, or like ionic. But um, something to remember, I don't know if we've spent a lot of time on the ion dipole. And that's the idea that water, you know, with its polarity. Um, you've got the partial negatives on the lone pairs here. And you get the partial positive on the hydrogens here is going to be attracted to, or it's going to hold, or it's going to attract to it um, ions. So like an OH minus is going to be attracted here, or a floating H plus is going to be attracted up here. And, and, and in doing so, you know, you're going to keep, you're going to keep ions in solution. You're going to maybe increase, and this is partly what, what helps increase the boiling point. If these things are attracted to each other, they're less likely to, to end up evaporating out of solution. Um, and of course, if we had the H plus being attracted here, you would end up with that hydronium ion anyhow. But that's just for H plus. You could, you know, we could also say the same thing for like an Na plus over here. Um, so ion dipole is, is really, it's, it's their way of kind of doing colligative properties without really doing colligative properties because they're trying to get away from memorizing formula and all students were doing the colligative properties with just memorizing the basic formula without really understanding what was happening. And, um, but with, with this, what's happening is that the ions go in and they create this ion dipole attraction and it's holding the water in solution longer, even though it's gaining energy. So, um, you do not have to do number 42, even though you have the answer and you can understand it. Hopefully now. <laughs> okay. So back to the questions. Uh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I can hear Mr. My bad. Oh, multiple choice number 74. Right there at the end. 
Now, oh, this is also a good time, and maybe you guys could remind me to do this with the class. I should probably talk over a little bit of strategies on Monday since we're not really going to get to talk strategies again until the end. Well, unless there's Google Hangouts. What used to happen is that 1 through 25 on the multiple choice were the easiest. And this is generally speaking. 26 through 50, harder. And then 51 through 75 were the hardest or most difficult, generally speaking. Um, and even if you look at this test, you might see some of the initial questions are, oh, I just it takes me two seconds. I can just put something down. But then if you're looking at question 74, I haven't gotten